So just for the next little while, I'm going to be talking about biodiversity and photography, um, why I'm talking about it with you guys today, some examples that are happening internationally that are really great in conservation efforts and some things you can do here at home in Ireland in order to help with biodiversity efforts through photography. And then there'll just be a few tips if you're looking to photograph in order to identify animals or if you're just looking to have a few photography tips as well. Um, but before I start with that, I suppose, uh, who is who is GAP or what is Global Action Plan? Um, we ourselves were a not-for-profit um, based out in Ballymun and we help people to live more sustainably. So we do that in a number of ways. We have a community garden where we help the local community um, out in Ballymun learn how to grow their own fruit and vegetables. Um, and as well as that, um, we work with businesses, schools and communities through workshops or longer, a couple of week long programs. And we come in and we do audits as well as that. Um, we were set up in 1995 as a voluntary group and then just grew from there. So we're, we're turning 26 this year. And as well as that, we're not on our own. There's 27 of us around the world. So what's really great about that is if we're having a problem with the community and we don't really know how to answer that, we kind of communicate with each other and we often run um, projects together um, through the Erasmus Plus and other organizations like that. Um, who am I? Um, I'm Joanna. Uh, I did an undergraduate in zoology. Um, so these are some of the pictures I've taken over the years. Uh, the bottom right I know looks alarming, but that was after a very safe mist netting with uh, professionals who are very trained. Um, and in the top left, if you can see, that's a Dick Dick Damara, um, a very cute little antelope. I know he's a bit camouflaged. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, I've, I've been a photographer throughout college. It's paid for my 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 pocket change and through through zoology and photography. Um, I'm now doing a climate change masters in DCU looking at uh, society policy and media. So it's kind of a, a combination of my loves. So that's what I'm doing here today. Um, but as well as that, I have had a brief brief uh, interaction with science and photography myself. So for my final year project, um, I looked at the stonefly. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen or heard of a stonefly. Um, the best way I like to describe it is if you're very into fishing, a lot of people would use mayflies and stoneflies for, as fishing bait. And so with that, um, they're really important. A lot of fish eat them and they're, they're really important for biodiversity in lakes. So my project in final year was to look at the veins of the wings, basically through photographs and to use these veins in order to tell if there was a difference between a population of stoneflies in Scotland and in Ireland. And that sounds kind of like, okay, why are you looking at the veins of this insect's wings? But these are really important um, in freshwater bodies. If they're there, basically without having to do loads of scientific testing, you know that this body of water is good enough to drink and you know that there's very little pollution there. So they're a really important bioindicator and they tell us a lot about a lake with just their presence. So they're really important to study. So I, I did use photography back in the day in order to do my final year project. I think we all know this man. Unfortunately, I didn't take this photo, um, but David Attenborough has been using visual stimulus for years in order to help people to kind of care a little bit more about the environment and biodiversity in the world. And I think he's a really good um, kind of role model in this field. And he's very much used it in order in his most recent documentaries because he has over 60 years of footage. He's used photography and filmography um, and videography in order to kind of explain to people that climate change is happening, that, pe that animals' habitats are being ruined. Um, so I always like to, to start off with David uh, when, I, when I talk about this subject. Another really kind of kind of staggering photo that I think broke broke the internet in, in some of the best way, in the best way possible, I think, was uh, by Justin Hoffman. He took this um, a couple of years ago and it won the Wildlife Photographer Award of the Year. And with this photo, it, it was on thousands of news outlets and it kind of really made a lot of people wake up to the fact that plastic isn't just this thing that goes in the bin because plastic doesn't decompose. It ends up in our oceans, it ends up in our environment. And one photograph, started a movement and now we see that Europe's trying to get rid of single use plastics. We see shops like Lidl and others trying to get rid of single use plastics. And it's become the buzzword of the day to say something's compostable rather than just a regular plastic. And a lot of this could be attributed to this single photo. So 
There has actually been a lot of studies done about visual use in order to help with climate change and with biodiversity. And this is just one of the many quotes out there. Um, but essentially, since the 60s, they've been using photography in order to show the difference between landscapes. So I, I'm sure many of you might have seen, oh, this is what it looked like back in the day. Here's the glacier. Here's the glacier now, barely existent. Um, but as well as that, when there were a lot of oil spills back in the 60s, 70s, it was a really great way to kind of make people aware that birds and animals and stuff were being affected by these oil spills, things we didn't think about until they're there in photo, uh, we, we don't care about. One example of how we do this in Global Action Plan uh, is through one of the courses we give to school kids. So we give a course called Budding Biodiversity. And in this, we try to explain why ecosystems are important and why various different species in an ecosystem are important. So for example, uh, in Yosemite, um, there used to be wolves. Uh, as you can see from our, from our diagram, we were explaining to the kids that the wolves kind of became extinct in Yosemite. And because of this, the deer took over, they became overpopulated. And then you can see in the top right-hand corner, the devastation that this caused to uh, the landscape in Yosemite. And we kind of explain that it's not just the fact that the grass is gone, it's that suddenly food for all these other animals that live in this park, that that's no longer available. And when you're trying to explain this park that's in a different continent to children, the best way to do that is through photos and say, here's what it looked like before, here's what it looks like now, to show the difference in landscapes. But that also explains why maintaining biodiversity. So biodiversity, if we break it down, is the number of different species living in a place. Um, so in order to protect this, in order to protect the wolf, to make sure that they're protected, to show them what happens when we get rid of them. Um, so it's a stark contrast, uh, but it's a positive story that we get to tell kids. Um, unfortunately, I then get asked about the Phoenix Park and what happens when there's no wolves, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, so some examples of international groups using this photography as a way to raise awareness, to raise funds and to help with conservation and biodiversity efforts. The first one that I just think is incredibly powerful is Joel Sartor, Sartor um, and the National Geographic. So since 2005, um, yeah, 2005, Joel Sartor started this because his wife got diagnosed with breast cancer and he was a National Geographic photographer. And essentially he had to stop his career of traveling around the world and he didn't really know what to do with himself. And the, the wife is fine, as I, as I said here, but essentially since 2005, there have been over 11,000 species photographed by this group. Um, and if we go back, the images are incredibly striking. And through this, a lot of prints have been sold and conservation efforts have been doubled and they give money to lots of the places where they would go and photograph these rare and endangered animals. So the yeah. safaris or the zoos or the um, sanctuaries where these animals stay in order to kind of help them with their efforts, any extra funds goes towards them. So it's using something that's a beautiful image in order to have real life impact on the ground. Um, if you want to support this, uh, I've left the website below, but also it's basically if you like a print by a print, there's a number of books as well. The National Geographic used these photos for a month series where they had different photos of the various different endangered species on the cover. And each of those species that might have been unknown beforehand, they all suddenly got a lot more awareness, a huge readership follow the National Geographic. And you're suddenly getting these very endangered species with a huge eye on them and being looked at, how can we protect these? Another example of this is the biodiversity group who've been around since 2003. So I think when we think of photography, we think, oh, it's a pretty picture of an animal, but all of the species in this photo here, in these photos here, they were undiscovered species, but because there is a bunch of photographers coming together to find these species, they were discovered and documented and added to the data collection, which is, as, as David Attenborough said, and as we saw in previous documents, if we don't know about a species, if we don't know it exists, how can we protect it? How do we know what environments it likes? Um, so the fact that we were even able to document these and share awareness of them meant that we could suddenly learn more uh, about them. So some of the impressive statistics they've kind of, they've been able to achieve with their photography efforts and conservation efforts are below. Um, but essentially they just combined the two things together. And when you have that science with communication, because I think one of our one of our big issues in the world today is we don't know how to effectively communicate the problems that are going on in our environment. And we don't know how to explain why someone should care 
when it's saying, hey, you should kind of inconvenience your life here. So photography really helps to cross that bridge um, over and to help people kind of learn, oh, wow, that's that looks like the frog that I saw in my back garden. Maybe I should want to protect that. Um, but a really great example of that is from a local photographer who I, I knew in college. Neither of us studied photography, but we both just kind of had a love of it. Um, so Creveen or Kevin, um, he, he studied law and just had this this great love of photography um, and he lives around the kind of northwestern region so he's around Sligo but goes around that area photographing wildlife and I think especially with the National Biodiversity Week this week um, having a, a kind of a theme with farmers and how do we get them involved in biodiversity I just thought this was a perfect example. So uh, Kevin for the last three years has been photographing these very very pretty hares and pine martens and badgers and he's just had a bunch of interactions with farmers because most of the time, if he wants to get access to these animals, he has to go onto farmland. And he's definitely, like I've included a few quotes here, he, chat, he chatted to me about it last week. Um, he's, had his, he's had his gear stolen, but he's also had people welcome him, welcome him with open arms. So it's been kind of an up and down battle, but the dialogue has been going on three years now. And I think one of the things he's kind of said is, uh, that's a lot of text, I'll kind of talk you through the main points, but if you want to read it or screenshot it for later, that's no problem. But one of the main things he kind of noticed was that when he started going in, he used to pretend that he was trying to photograph the sheep or trying to photograph the trees or just like the insects and the farmers kind of, they're not stupid. And they essentially were like, oh no, come on now, I know you're looking for the good stuff. Um, the pine martens and the badgers and all the things that eat their livestock or attack their livestock or give them disease. But the second he said, okay, I'll be open and honest with you about that. A lot of, he discovered that a lot of the farmers already knew that there was a badger den on the land or that there were foxes roaming amongst the sheep. And when there was an honesty there and he kind of showed them pictures and said, here's what I've been taking. They kind of had this pride that this is what's on their land and these beautiful images are coming from their land. And, and, and essentially he brought them into the conversation. And I think that's something that photography does that maybe statistics don't do because if you are a farmer and it's your livestock and a disease can completely affect your whole herd you don't really care about a statistic, but when you see an animal, and I don't think farmers love their animals and they, they are people who love the environment. And when they get to see it up close or see the eyes of the, 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 the badgers that are causing them a bit of havoc, they're a little bit more lenient with them. Uh, here's some examples. So um, we see the fox up there in the top left and the farmer who he talked to where he got this picture he said yeah they know that there's a vixen living around with some cubs and that picture I think if you were a farmer would scare the bejesus out of you um but the fact that the farmer was saying look you know if it's all nature so I really should just kind of live and let live um Kevin has also done some really great YouTube videos um on his on his channel where he talks about like how he photographs the badgers and all the hares and all the kind of more rare animals in Ireland and he's bringing awareness of the pine marten which the pine marten funnily enough is helping with our really big problem of an of the gray squirrel so the gray squirrel uh while it's incredibly adorable is actually an invasive species and for years has been giving our red squirrel a big amount of problems so the pine marten has been really successful in recent years at regrowing its numbers and pine martens eat gray squirrels because gray squirrels are a little bit bigger and a little bit slower than the red squirrels. So nature is kind of tends to sort itself out once we leave it alone and once we look to protect it. And uh, Kevin here by working with farmers is really helping to raise awareness of all these really important species. Kind of like with Yosemite, when we get rid of the wolf, there's a huge amount of problem. If we were to get rid of the deer, or get rid of the fox completely or get rid of the hare, we would have the same huge problems in Irish landscape. So before I get into the specific biodiversity photography tips, I think the main thing I'd want to say is even if you're not an animal photographer um, and you just take photos on your phone, you can still help biodiversity. Uh, the main, I like to say it's peer pressure, but these are pictures of cleanups I organized with friends. And I posted these pictures online and I had people message me saying, hey, I felt bad that I couldn't go to that cleanup. So I did a little bit of a cleanup on the beach today. And the photography showing people that you can see yourself maybe interacting with or you can see yourself in encourages you to do things. And that's 
that's kind of when we look at marketing on social media and the fact that there's this influencer culture why not harness that for something good like saying hey all the cool people are cleaning up which i know in itself sounds incredibly not cool but it has been shown to work so if any time you're outside cleaning or you're with friends out in nature, it's it's an incredibly positive thing to share with people and to take photos of. So I would say that even if you're like, I don't think I could be um, wildlife photographer for, uh, of the year. Uh, so there's whatever your skills is perfect and will still help. So some really great things happening in Ireland. Uh, we actually have an app and um, we have a biodiversity data capture app and it uses your phone camera. So when you're out going on a walk, if you see a bug that you might have never seen before, or you think it's a kind of a cool bug or anything like that, you can go onto this app, record it. It will actually use the GPS on your phone and send that data to the National Biodiversity Centre, which is incredibly important because they constantly need to keep tabs of what species are in Ireland, if there's a change because of climate change, if there's migration changes. And when we take pictures and we share this citizen science efforts of ours, this instantly makes their job easier. Um, they don't even need you to say, I know exactly what species it is, I know what diameter it is. Uh, they just need you to take the photo and give what whatever information you can. Um, I know as well, there's been a lot of promotion um, around photography competition and um, biodiversity. Um, so that's an incredibly important one as well. It encourages a love of animals, kind of like with Kevin and the farmers, when you kind of see something and how cute they are, you're a little bit more likely to say, oh, that's, I didn't know Ireland had that animal or um, a, a lot of people I know didn't know the Pine Martin, what it was or what it looked like. Uh, so it's photos really help with kind of explaining that and go, it's, yeah, it, it eats animals, but it's very cute while it does it, you know? Um, and as well as that, there's a bio blitz. So they encourage you for a weekend a year. So it was actually last weekend, do it any weekend they encourage you to go look around your garden, see any insects you can find. If there's any you don't know for the weekend that's in it, they get some of the scientists to come and help. So you can send in a picture and say, I don't know what this is, can you please tell me? And for the weekend, they'll get back to you as soon as they can and let you know, which I think is a really great resource and helps with, helps with their efforts, but also helps you to kind of learn more about your own back garden. Um, the other thing you can do is send the NGOs or um, groups in order to raise awareness about particular species. So what if you were to send, for example, to, um, if everyone was to send a bunch of pictures to Global Action Plan and we said we gave this talk and here are some of the great uh, photos that came from it, suddenly our audience gets to see, oh, these are animals that live in Ireland and it's just spreading the word um, where maybe people are sick of listening to the words or reading the words, but when they see the picture, it, it makes a huge difference as well. Some other examples of photography and citizen science and some really great resources. Um, there's some very cool groups on Facebook. I know Facebook's going a little bit dead at the moment, but this Inse Insects and Invertebrates group of Ireland, it's so handy. Um, when I was studying zoology, I used it a lot kind of to help with my homework sometimes <laughs> where I'd be like, I'm, I'm out in a bug hunt and I don't know what this is. And these experts for free just give you these such big answers with all this information like you can see an example here on the right hand side and it there's loads of resources there as well and one thing I will say I know I studied zoology but seeing a group like this with so many people who love insects who photograph them you kind of get this appreciation for something that you used to be like oh that's so gross I can't believe that's near me I'm horrible and um, I even I kind of had to get over that but you learn to see the beauty in, you know, so that beetle, I think it's a bee press today, looks like a brooch. Um, and there's just something pretty stunning about that. So some tips if you are new to uh, identification photography. So if you want to get involved in citizen science, I suppose the main thing is where you can, if you have your location where the photo was taken, that really helps them because Sometimes you might find a species or a bug or an animal that has never been seen in that county before, or that part of the county before, and that's incredibly important to them for their for their knowledge in order to kind of adjust. So, for example, if the stonefly was found in a in a lake that had never been and it had never been found there before, that's a really great piece of news to say. Hey, the quality of this water is improving. That's amazing. Um, as well as that, if you can put something like a coin or something to kind of give a scale 
um, reference that's really really helpful for people who are identifying species if you just take a picture of a spider and they have no idea if it's small big medium um, it's really hard to identify because sometimes they identify it based on the number of uh, I know for for certain bugs the number of gills in the water like and it's and they're so tiny you have to do that on a microscope so even if you if you're a bit creeped out don't worry but if you can put your thumbnail beside it that really helps as well with identification purposes if you're using a phone, and I very much mean this just about insects, a flash can be really helpful because a lot of the time they have markings on the back that might not show when you don't use a flash. Um, with mammals, I would really say do not use a flash at all where possible. It's kind of damaging to them. I, I know there used to be a, a culture of lamping here in Ireland, and I'm very much saying don't do that. <laughs> um, and then finally, if you do have a bigger DSLR camera, uh, one of the fancier ones, and you're really looking to get into identification photography on smaller animals specifically, um, a macro lens could really make a difference. They are quite expensive, but they focus in on the smaller details like the kind of the prickly ends of an insect or things like that. So it's something to consider, but not something that I would say you have to do, especially when the apps just tell you to use your, your phone. Um, but that's just if you're kind of looking to take the next step. So some don'ts regarding citizen science and photography. Um, so I've given you three examples here and the, these are all photos I've taken. And the one on the right is actually um, down in Wexford, uh, we're neighbours with the farmer who, who has venison. And so I took this photo with permission um, and I was pretty close. But if you see on the left hand side, the deer haven't looked at me. Um, they're from a they're quite they're from quite a big distance. I have a quite a big lens on and the deer aren't noticing me. That's when you are with deer, that's kind of how it should be. If the deer notice you like on the right hand side, like the right side photo, you are too close to them. They are wild animals and essentially you are kind of putting them on high alert and it, it's quite cruel to them in a way because they are semi-domesticated, especially in the Phoenix Park. So a lot of people go up to them and feed them grass, but that's kind of when accidents happen and deers feel like they're, you know, being cornered and start attacking other people or dogs or things like that. And it's not really their fault. We are getting too close to them because we want a picture. So if you are looking to photograph mammals, I would suggest maybe invest in a big lens. And if you have to, if you can't get the photo, don't get the photo. Um, with the hashtag, this is a really, it's actually a really great way to help with biodiversity and looking after conservation efforts. Um, there was the school in UCD are doing a lot of work on the deer in the Phoenix Park and they tried to get this hashtag trending on social media to teach people about leaving these wild animals alone because they are wild animals, um, very cute wild animals, but wild animals nonetheless. <clears throat> so just to finish that point, I've kind of given an example from one of my trips during zoology. We went to Gibraltar and this picture I think a lot of people are just like wow it's a monkey that's so cute um, but there's a huge problem here in that this animal is cornered and if you are a wild animal you would feel attacked and very much in danger here so if a monkey had a, it like if, if this specimen had gone on to attack one of these people um, I know everyone would be like wow that's crazy I can't believe they did that but if you look at evolutionary terms, if you're in a, if you're trying to save your life, if you're trying to avoid be, being caught by a predator, this is such a dangerous setting to you um, that you, of course, might attack to protect yourself. So it's something to really consider when you want to get into photography and biodiversity. It can be so beneficial, but I think it's important to realize, like I said in the point here, um, you're essentially going into their living room with the camera and saying, hey, what's up? Um, and if you were sitting in your living room right now and someone came in unannounced, you'd be a bit like, well, this is very weird. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable. Um, but the further away you are, uh, the better. And you kind of give them a little bit of space to know that if they need to escape, they can. And that's really important. Um, knowing when to give up the shot, I know that sounds really bad, but I think it's also really important to know it's not worth it. It's not worth taking the photo um, to put this animal in danger or in discomfort. For example, um, a lot of the shots for uh, the David Attenborough series, uh, Planet Earth, the guys who got the snow leopards on camera, they waited two months in a tent on a mountain 
and peed into bottles and didn't move at all in order to to get the footage um, because they became a part of the landscape and they weren't making any animal act in a way that's not how they naturally act. Um, I'm not saying you need to go live on a, on Crow Patrick for two months just to get a picture of an animal, but it's the more patient you are. So I know um, in Kevin's video, he kind of says, I go back to the same spot every day. I learn the movements of the animals. I learn when they come out naturally to feed. I learn when the babies come out to play. I don't know if he goes into that much detail, but um, I know for a fact he visits the same places over and over again. He stays quiet. He sits there for a few hours. And if he doesn't get the shot, he goes home. And if he does, then it's happy days. Um, and I think for biodiversity and photography, that's a really I, I'm not as patient as him, and that's why I don't have as many beautiful pictures of, of animal wildlife as he does. Um, the other thing I would say is just as important as it was to start a dialogue with the farmers in order to help them realize the amazing biodiversity on their land, it's important not to enter their land without permission because it is trespassing. And while you get really excited with the camera and you go, wow, look at that cute animal, um, I think it's important to make sure that we're not doing anything illegal. <laughs> um, some general photography tips, uh, whatever gear you have is the best gear. So I included these pictures on the side as an example. Um, I was in Namibia in 2017 before uh, COVID and before I felt uber guilty about the flying and the carbon of it all. Um, but the top picture was a sunrise on a sand dune and that was a beautiful sunrise, but it killed my camera. Uh, completely killed it and it was a very sad day but a very beautiful sunrise so the first two I took on my nice fancy camera and the last picture I, I either took on a pretty like little point and shoot camera or else my phone but it's still a picture of a cheetah and it still reminds me of that amazing time that I got to see a cheetah in, in real life and it still brings back all these memories and it it's still a fine photo do you know what I mean so I think the main thing is to get over this idea that you need to have the best camera in order to take the best picture uh, the best picture is the one that brings awareness or shares information or educates someone so the next thing I'd say is take 100 photos and five might be good um, so when I'm not giving workshops I do photography as, as a side as a side job and I might go out on a shoot and take 450 photos and I will send 100 to a client. And that's me having taken photos for almost 10 years now. So I think it's really important to know that having we're in a, we're in a very lucky point in, in a time where we have digital cameras, we don't have film and we have that opportunity to say, well, I'll just give myself a safety net here. And I think that's a, a really great thing. And we shouldn't uh, just for our pride and go, no, I'm going to get the perfect shot once and I don't need to go again. I think that's just us being a bit prideful. And I think take take lots of pictures and um, make photography a habit if you want to get better. So during COVID, it was actually really helpful where I would go out because I was bored and just bring the camera with me and that became a habit. And so some days it would be really grim and grey and some days you get a perfect sunset and get so lucky and it's kind of the same with landscape photography, people photography, but also with biodiversity photography. You could do the same walk 50 times and not see an interesting animal and then on the 50th, 50th time you see this amazing bug or mammal or anything or bird and you don't have, if you don't have your camera that's, that's game over. So the habit of it all really makes a difference. Uh, the next thing I would say is start with what you know. So if you have a pet at home, I, and I'm sure if you have a pet at home, you're already doing this, but I would say take as many pictures of that pet as possible because, you know, a cat or a dog, they have their mammals, they're great practice. Or uh, if you, if you're lucky enough to have a reptile or something like that, it's, it's great to know kind of what light works to show off the skin, to show off the fur, to show off the colors. And um, so start with what you know. And the next thing I would say is connect with groups online. So like the insects and invertebrates group I mentioned earlier, there's loads of different ones. Um, there's biodiversity groups that are definitely connected to Biodiversity Week. Um, when uh, COVID is not a thing, we have volunteers in the garden, um, which looks at more so plant biodiversity. So I talked a lot about animal biodiversity, but you know, if you're interested in looking at different types of vegetables and plants, that's definitely something you could help volunteer, bring your camera along, do a little bit of gardening, help out and then take a few pictures. We, we always like the free publicity as well. Um, 
but as there's loads of groups online um, international groups and Irish groups. The last one, I know it's a bit of a cop out, but continue to learn. Um, so I'm, I haven't, I'm not able to click into the chat just yet because the screen is not letting me, but I'll look at them all after and I'm excited to see if anyone has any resources to share. Um, but continue to learn. YouTube is just props up so many different sectors of society. I watched a YouTube video and retaught myself how to use a software I hadn't used in years for free. And we kind of take that for granted, but there are so many tutorials on photography, on videography online for free, that yes, if you then, after you've practiced, want to upgrade your gear or want to take actual classes, that's amazing. But you could get to such a point for free without much effort that it's just, it's, it's such a great time to want to get into photography. If you do decide to buy some better gear to get into photography, I would recommend buying secondhand because cameras are just as good five years, like the camera I've had, I've had for five years and it still takes amazing pictures. Not the one that died on the sand dune, but the one, I, the one I've been using recently. Um, it continues to take amazing pictures. And if I was to sell that to buy an upgraded one because I'm a professional, it would still be taking just as great pictures. So I would recommend buying, buying secondhand where, where you can. So I know I kind of sped through that uh, because I, I'm aware of lunchtime. So thank you so much for listening.